Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager, and welcome to the MTOM Show podcast. We're on location today at the Griffun Farm in Polk County, Iowa, where they held two dignitaries, two secretaries of agriculture, one from the United States and one from Mexico. Now, USMCA was a big topic in the last administration. Now, the current administration is trying to sort things out and keep those relationships with both Canada and Mexico. On the farm visit, the Secretary of Agriculture from Mexico talked about buying U.S. corn. We get into a discussion with Tom Vilsack, who is back as head of USDA, about what he is seeing and finding in this next era of Washington, D.C., and what political stomachs they're willing to take in the Biden administration. Today, we're going to cover trade. We'll talk about China, new markets, as well as that Canadian and Mexican market. Then we'll also kind of diverge into discussing the meat industry, how he was just on Capitol Hill last week having a conversation with Congress. And we'll then also cover the plight of the American worker. That is this installment of the MTOM Show podcast. If you have any feedback, hit me up at paul.yeager at iowapbs.org or send us an email at market to market at iowapbs.org. Now our sit-down conversation with the United States Department of Agriculture's head and secretary, Tom Vilsack. Secretary Vilsack, you're here in Iowa. You're playing tour guide a little bit. Um, why is it important to have a good relationship with Mexico? Well, it's important to have a good relationship first and foremost with uh, my counterpart in Mexico because you have to have the ability to pick up the phone uh, or visit face to face and have frank and uh, trusted conversation. Uh, so that relationship becomes important to build. Um, I've, I actually have a relationship with Secretary Villalobos for some time, uh, so it's been a little bit easier uh, with him. Uh, it's important for the U.S.-Mexico relationship because so much of what we trade, so much of what we, what we sell overseas, if you will, uh, in our export, uh, one of our number uh, top three markets is Mexico for many of our products. In some cases, it's our number one market. So it's important, obviously, to make sure that we continue to have a good relationship. We continue to identify the problem areas in the relationship and try to work through them. USMCA was, I mean, you were familiar with NAFTA from your previous time. USMCA comes along. That was a big goal of the administ previous administration. How have you sorted through some of those changes and conversations you've had with Mexico? And you can throw in your Canadian counterparts, too. Well, I think the conversation with Mexico has been a little bit easier uh, as it relates to USMCA because the problems we have there, uh, I think we can work through. For example, uh, while it is accurate that uh, Mexico has taken a pretty hard line in terms of genetically engineered crops that are grown in Mexico, it has not prevented that country from continuing to import into the country, corn that's grown here in the U.S. using uh, GMO, GE technology. Um, our friends in Canada, it's a little different situation. Uh, one of the principal reasons why Congress voted in favor of the USMCA from an agricultural perspective was the belief that Canada would in fact open up its market for U.S. dairy. Uh, we are still having conversations with our Canadian friends about that. Uh, and we have actually triggered the consultation process or begun the consultation process that is provided for in the USMCA when you have a difficulty or a disagreement that's not getting worked, uh, worked through. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of USMCA, that there's actually a mechanism uh, for putting something on the table when you have a disagreement with uh, your trading partner. That's really important. Uh, our hope is that we, we get a resolution. Uh, the, obviously, there was an election in Canada, and that made a difference in terms of people's attitudes, but hopefully uh, we're now in a position to, for Canada to understand that we are very serious about that market access and that we expect to see it. Trade's incredibly important on many aspects. Uh, last week the market seemed to yawn when it was announced that Mexico bought a bunch of U.S. corn. Why does that need to be more uh, of an importance when Mexico is buying U.S. corn? Well, it's important for us to have diversified market opportunities. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of interest and a lot of focus on China because that's a very large purchaser. 
and has been recently. Uh, obviously, during the trade war, that was not the case, and, and commodity prices reflected that. Uh, but I think the best way we can provide assistance and help for our farmers is to make sure we have multiple markets. And some markets will be small, some markets will be large. Mexico is, happens to be a large market. We want to preserve that. Uh, it's a convenient market, obviously, the transportation expense. It's one of the reasons why we have a competitive edge in that market. Uh, we want to maintain that. Uh, but we can't be satisfied with just that market. Uh, we have to look for other opportunities. Uh, China is obviously one of those. But I think we even have to go deeper and further. Uh, I think we have to continue to look for ways in which we can uh, diversify, especially within uh, Southeast Asia, because I think there are enormous opportunities there. And I think we need to begin thinking about the strategy as it relates to Africa, uh, because there's going to be a significant increase in population in that continent, and it's going to be important for us to, to, uh, to be competitive. Farmers for Free Trade last week were asking you to look at other markets, specifically in Asia. Uh, is China a country you can't even have a conversation with right now? No, I, I've had several conversations with my counterpart uh, in China. Uh, it's not that you can't have a conversation. It, it's that uh, there are so many layers to the Chinese relationship. There, the, the complexity of that relationship is pretty significant. And at any point in time, one of those layers could impact and affect every other layer. Let me give you an example. There could be a situation with Taiwan. There could be a situation in the South China Sea. There could be a situation in Hong Kong. Uh, there could be a situation in which minorities in China uh, are being oppressed. All of that, any of that, could potentially trigger a reaction that leads to a, a change of decisions by the Chinese government in terms of purchases that are being made. We saw during the course of the trade war that the Chinese government can can make decisions fairly quickly to start or to stop trade. And so in order for us to be more confident in a, in a long-term uh, trading uh, strategy, we need to make sure we have multiple markets so that if at some point in time, for whatever reason, that relationship changes or is altered, we're in a position to pivot uh, so that we don't see the dramatic drop in commodity prices that we experienced during the trade war. U.S. Trade Ambassador Lighthizer took a different approach to China than what your trade rep under the Obama administration had taken with China. And now Catherine Tai last week kind of said, we're going to keep some of the Trump era uh, tariffs in place. What have you noticed in changes from your last service, the four years you were out, and now your first year back in? Well, I think Ambassador Tai uh, understands the significance of relationships, and I think she wants to be able to establish a relationship with her counterpart in China, similar to what I have uh, with Secretary Villalobos here in Mexico. Uh, the ability to be able to talk frankly and honestly and openly about whatever differences we may have. Uh, I think she is absolutely right in spending uh, the time now in pointing out to China that they made certain promises in the phase one trade agreement. They made promises concerning biotechnology. They made promises concerning uh, a variety of, uh, of, uh, of issues and the a sanitary, sanitary and phytosanitary system. Uh, they did a pretty good job, but they didn't do a perfect job. They made 57 commitments. They've gone through with 50 of them, but there's still seven big ones left. She also pointed out uh, that they made purchasing commitments. And while they have seriously uh, sig and significantly increased purchases, they're still not at the level that they promised to be. So I think it's appropriate for her to start the, start the conversation with a, uh, <laughs> with a pesky fly, fly. Yeah. Uh, with essentially saying to China, look, before we can have conversations about the future, about the nature of this relationship, we've got to make sure that we're following through on the promises we made. Uh, if not, that creates a, a level of, of, of uncertainty about the relationship. So it'll be interesting to see how China reacts uh, to, that, to that first step. Uh, so I'm, I appreciate she taking that step. I appreciate she taking a hard line, which is live up to your promises. Uh, if they live up, that means $5 billion more of agricultural products from the U.S. going to China uh, than before, and that obviously will be helpful. China is a nonstop news event uh, if, if, for those that follow trade. And it, have you read anything differently from previous services in, in relationships. Are, are the Chinese treating you differently? Well, I, I had a very good relationship with my counterpart in China, uh, and he has since left. Uh, 
but I think the uh, I, I think uh, he he has been able to convey to his successor that I'm somebody that will have an honest conversation with him, somebody that will uh, will will speak frankly and honestly, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had good conversations so far uh, with my counterpart there, and and I would expect we'll continue to have those conversations. Last week, your office uh, released some water infrastructure improvements and infrastructure improvements specifically in Iowa. I want to ask about just one thing as a, as a base point. Ashton, Iowa, they got a $1 million loan, a $947,000 grant for water improvements. Why are those important to have those, especially we're in the middle of major drought in western Iowa and the west and into Canada? Well, there are a variety of different ways in which uh, we provide assistance in, in terms of water. In some cases, we are basically creating access to water. Um, in some cases, we're, t we're dealing with a wastewater uh, treatment system or a drainage system, or we may be dealing with a stormwater system. All of this is important in terms of uh, quality of life, in terms of the, the ability of communities to attract businesses uh, to the community, the ability of uh, the community to service the needs of their uh, citizens, the ability to expand population, uh, the ability to ensure safe drinking water. Uh, all of that is tied into our, into our water programs. Uh, and we are basically the provider, if you will, of resources for rural water. Uh, so it, it may very well be access. So you didn't have access to clean drinking water, now you do. It could be that your wastewater treatment facility is antiquated, now you get to modernize it. It may be that your streets flood every time there's just a drop of rain, now that's not the case. People's basements are protected uh, and you've basically created a, a better quality of life. It's a combination of uh, many of those things and all of those grants. You just a minute ago talked about relationships with China. You have relationships with the United Auto Workers. They're striking against John Deere, major uh, manufacturer in this country. I mean, they had tried to send work to other countries. They're back in the United States. You're going to go talk to some of those picketers after we get done here. What's that conversation like with those two groups? Are they two different messages? Not necessarily. The message to, to, to uh, both the union and to the to uh, dear uh, officials, if we have conversations with folks, is to simply look. Uh, you guys understand and appreciate that farmers, in particular in Iowa, are uh, and particularly in the Midwest and across the country, are dependent on the equipment and parts that you all make. And so, to the extent that you can get your issues resolved in a fair and equitable way for everyone, we would encourage that. Um, I'm speaking to the UAW folks in large part because of a relationship. Uh, you know, when you, get, when you run for office, uh, there are people that are for you and there are people who aren't for you. Um, and oftentimes when you're running, and particularly if you're running from behind, and, and you're fortunate enough, as I was, to be elected governor after being behind for most of my 1998 campaign, you kind of remember the people that were with you when nobody else was. Well, those folks at the UAW were very supportive of me during my run for governor. And so you just don't want to forget the people that, uh, that got you there, just in the same way that I don't want to forget uh, the people of Mount Pleasant who gave me an opportunity to be a mayor or the people of Iowa who, uh, who allowed me the opportunity and honor to be a governor for eight years. I, I wouldn't have the current job I have, but for all of those folks, and you just don't want to forget them. The American worker in the food system right now has gone through many different uh, changes in the last year and a half since COVID. Uh, Meatpacking industry has said they can't get enough workers in. Trucking industry, we don't have enough drivers. Uh, manufacturing plants, we don't have enough workers. Is this anything to do with NAFTA offshoots from years ago? Is this a worker training issue? What are we seeing come to a head other than simple supply and demand? Well, I think there was a major disruption from the pandemic. I mean, look at it. We shut down a substantial portion of the economy of the country. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, we've unfortunately and tragically lost uh, hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens and millions of them have been sick. There has been a major disruption, and it causes, uh, I think, a lot of soul searching on the part of a lot of folks. And there may very well be people that were contemplating retirement or contemplating uh, a change in, in opportunity before the pandemic, and maybe this basically accelerated their timeline. Uh, at the end of the day, what you have to do in a disruption is you, you basically have to figure out strategies to cope and to, and to deal with the disruption until you get to a more stable and secure place. Um, I think. It does emphasize the need in this country to continue to look for ways in which we can honor those who not only work with their head, but also with their hands. Uh, and if there's uh, any long-term issue here, 
I think it's the fact that for far too long, we didn't understand or appreciate all those folks who, who work with their hands. And I'll give you an example in USDA. Uh, we send young men and women uh, into our force that are burning at incredibly hot temperatures. And we were paying those folks $13 an hour. And some of them were temporary workers. And some of them, because they were temporary and because they have to move from fire to fire, didn't have a place to stay, so they stayed in their car while they were fighting the fire. Now, uh, we've got work to do to basically say, wait a second, let's step back here and recognize what these folks do for us. They protect our homes, they protect our lives, they protect our, our forests, they protect our communities. And maybe we ought to have a, a, a compensation system that reflects the risk and reflects the importance of their work. And maybe we should figure out a way in which they could have a, a hot shower every night in a place where they got a decent bed. And so we're working on uh, improving the compensation for these farmers, and we're working with uh, a number of entities to try to figure out transitional housing, if you will, uh, so that they are respected for the work that they do. And I think that's probably true across a lot of professions uh, and occupations where people work with their hands, they do manual. Um, we got to understand they are incredibly important to an economy, and they need to be valued. The budget process is always a challenge, but in the firefighting business, especially in the West, a lot of the money gets eaten up in fighting and, and, and none of the forest cleanup can happen. Uh, th is there any hope of trying to be able to shift some money uh, from other areas because of the environmental concerns? And the president has a strong environmental agenda. Well, th there's, not, there's something more than hope. There's actual uh, investment. Uh, previous administration didn't fully utilize the uh, fire fix that Congress had enacted that would uh, provide for additional resources for fighting the fires. Uh, we are using that resource um, and we believe that there will be sufficient resources uh, to fight the fires and at the same time uh, not have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, having said that, the president's budget for next year contains a significant increase in the firefighting budget which guarantees that we won't be robbing Peter to pay Paul and we'll be able to use those resources for the specific purpose for which they were intended. And I believe that when Congress passes the reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill, that additional resources are gonna be made available. So over a period of time, and it will take time, Paul, this is a situation where we didn't get into this mess overnight. We're not gonna get out of it overnight. We're gonna to have to have a long-term commitment to, to better forest management, reforestation, that's going to take resources, a significantly greater amount of resources. It's also going to take more resources for treatment so that we are preventing these mega fires. We know from our experience, even with the recent fires, the Calder fire in California, because we had advanced treatment uh, prior to that fire, we were able to save uh, South Tahoe uh, from more destruction. So we need to do much, much more of that. That requires resources. I think those resources are coming. Last subject. Last week you were in Congress talking about the, the meatpacking industry. Kind of talked a little bit about the worker earlier. Uh, what's this administration going to be able to do for, is there a going to be, is there a stomach politically to try to break up big companies? You talk about competition earlier at the event. There's been programs to help smaller processors. Is this administration looking at more of that help? or more of a breakup of these large players? Well, our, our focus right now is on capacity and competition, and I think they go hand in hand. Uh, if you expand capacity, you're also gonna expand competition. Well, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is you take a look at your existing uh, processing capacity, your existing processing plants, and ask the question, are there ways in which you can expand? Are there ways in which you can create new market opportunities? The answer is yes and yes. So we're providing resources in the form of grants and loans to be able to expand, uh, to change market opportunities, to expand market opportunities. Is there a way of reducing the cost for existing facilities so they stay in business? Answer, yes. We're providing resources to reduce the cost of inspection. But is there also a way in which we can use resources to expand new capacity or to build on significantly to existing capacity? And the answer to those questions is yes. And we're doing all of that. Um, and I think we want to see how that works um, and I believe that over the course of the next year or so, you're going to begin to see investments 
uh, being made, uh, processing being expanded. And what this is going to do is it creates competition, but it also creates resiliency. And part of the challenge here that we found with having too few processing facilities, when one shuts down, it creates chaos in the market, disrupts the market. We've got to have more, uh, more, more capacity. We have to have the ability to shift uh, because this is the last disruption that we're going to be faced with. It may be drought, it may be fire, it may be COVID, it may be something else, but, but we know that these disruptions are going to occur. So the focus now is on not just great efficiency uh, and productivity, but also on, uh, uh, on uh, re resiliency. And with resiliency, it means expanded capacity, and, and we're investing mm -hmm. in expanded capacity. We're also uh, making sure that we strengthen uh, the rules and laws governing the relationship between the producers and the packers, right? Um, there may be circumstances and situations in some industries where, uh, where the playing field's not quite level, uh, and that's why we get into the Packers and Stockyards Act. It may also be that we need to have better discovery. We be better have understanding of what, what the price actually is. There's so, so few cash uh, transactions uh, that it sometimes you, you begin to wonder whether or not uh, the price that you're being quoted is really the price it should be quoted. So more price discovery. So a variety of things that need to be done and are being done. If only another two days, we'd get into price discovery for the rest of the conversation. Secretary <laughs> Vilsack, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. My thanks to Tom Vilsack for sitting for those questions. Uh, again, if you have any feedback, hit us up market to market at iowapbs.org. Like, share, subscribe. Every new episode comes out on a Tuesday. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.